Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to a presentation about our project, which is detecting Alzheimer's disease in its early stages using machine learning. So the people in our group are... I'm Nandini. I'm Shriya. I'm Shriya Natarajan. I'm Aditya Rao. And I'm Vanessa. And our advisor was Mr. Subramanian. Now for a table of contents, we'll be starting with the introduction, then moving on to explaining the data set we use for this project, then explaining the methodology or steps we took to get our results, and then going into the progress we've made so far. So before we start off with any project, it's important to understand why exactly we're taking the time and effort to build this project. Next slide. So what is Alzheimer's disease? It's a form of dementia that causes the slow deterioration of the brain. Brain tissue is made up of white matter and gray matter, but in this disease, the gray matter is primarily affected. Protein deposits in the brain called amyloid plaques build up. And when these beta proteins bunch together, they cause a breakdown of the gray matter in the brain. This disease affects specific brain sections, including the hippocampus, cerebral cortex, and the temporal lobe. But because this deterioration is such a slow process, most patients are often unaware of their condition until severe symptoms show or even death occurs. Next slide. And what's more is that these deteriorations are often unclear in MRI scans, especially when the disease is in its early stages. So it becomes hard to diagnose. So we wanted to come up with a way in which a machine learning algorithm would read the scans and accurately diagnose the disease based off of those scans when the disease is in its early stages. And by doing so, by creating these interpretable visualizations of the risk, even if there's no cure, patients with Alzheimer's can get early access to treatment and medications can help limit memory loss and reduce decline in the brain and its functions. And in this way, patients can have more chances to make changes in their lifestyle. So now let's go on to explaining the data. Next one. So here are four images of MRI scans in different stages. So as you can see, there's moderately demented, mildly demented, non-demented, and partially demented. Uh, now let's move on to the, some of the methods that we discussed in our project. So uh, the first step in our data science process is collecting data. And when we started uh, trying to find our data, uh, usually uh, medical related data is pretty confidential. So importing the data uh, into Google Colab was also challenging because only one person was able to access the data at a time. So to combat this issue, we imported the data set directly into Google Colab. And if you didn't know what Google Colab is, it's a shared notebook, a Jupyter notebook that allows us to create uh, documents that contain live code, text, and equations. And with this, we were able to uh, we were able to use the code with a combination of batch of batch script and Python. So the next step was exploratory and data analysis. Uh, we looked at images of the demented versus the non-demented brain scans. And it took uh, a lot of research to find the actual differences because looking at the images, it was pretty hard to tell the differences between a demented and non-demented. And understanding our data better would help us, would help guide us uh, when training our model to recognize a uh, demented versus non-demented brain scan. Okay. Moving on to the next step in building the model, which was data pre-processing. This is essentially data cleaning and making the data ready to use for the model. Once we got familiar with our data set, we had to clean the data to make it useful for training. One of the major pre-processing steps that we had to do was to recategorize the images so that we only had two classes rather than the, cl the three classes we showed earlier. We moved all the images of demented brains into one class so that it was just a simple classification between demented brains and non-demented brains. Some other steps included resizing the images, reducing the aspect ratio, as well as creating directories and file paths so that our model could access the data. Next slide, please. Once we, yeah. 
Once we got the data ready to work, we were then able to work on actually building the model. The first step when building the model was selecting the model that we choose to use. Within machine learning, there's plenty of different model types and algorithms that we have available to us, but we ultimately chose to use neural networks because neural networks are extremely effective at recognizing complex relationships between input and output data. And neural networks typically tend to outperform other types of algorithms, which is a huge factor in our case because we wanted to design the best net, the best algorithm possible that would lead the most lead to the most accurate results. So how does a neural network work? For a bit of like simple contextualization, a neural network is essentially composed of many layers of nodes, which are represented in this diagram with as circles. The first layer is the input layer, the last layer is the output layer, and in between there are a number of hidden layers. The hidden layers are what is responsible for performing the calculations and ultimately achieving the result. Nodes of different layers are connected to one another via channels, which are like the lines you see in the diagram. So how does this work? The, the neural networks tend to work based on forward propagation. In this all the inputs are transferred via channel to a node into the next layer, with multiple inputs potentially going into the same node. Each of these channels have a weight associated with it, and this weight depends on how important to the output that particular input is. Essentially, the weight is simply a number that the input is multiplied by. The network then sums all these weighted inputs that go into the same node, and this number enters the node of the first hidden layer. Another number, called the bias, is then added to this sum. Once this new number is obtained, it is passed through a given activation function, which determines whether or not a certain neuron is activated by checking if the output is above a specific threshold value. If the neuron is activated, the output of that particular neuron then becomes input for the next hidden layer, which is why this type of network is called a feed-forward network. This process essentially repeats itself until the output layer is reached. Once we reach the output layer, the model then uses backpropagation to better improve its accuracy. Essentially, when training the model, the model knows the actual output or the actual label, in this case, whether or not the scan was demented or not demented. Once it receives an output, it then checks with the actual result and calculates the error. This error is then sent back to the input layer and the weights and biases are adjusted accordingly. So as you can see, when this forward propagation and back propagation repeats itself many, many times, the weights and biases are adjusted and ultimately an accurate model is built. And I do want to point out that this is quite a simplified version. There's a lot more to neural networks like epochs, batch size, and specific threshold functions. But the essential component of a neural network is basically just a lot of math. So here are our results so far. Um, as shown here, these are some images that were outputted from our code. Um, initially, the images were extremely blurry and pixelated, and that was a problem that we ran into. Um, it was the figure size of the images that didn't match up perfectly. So with blurry images, um, the model wouldn't have been able to function properly, um, but we were able to effectively uh, reshape them and fix the quality of the images. So this is an example of our code. Um, the model that we used was called exception and the weights were from the uh, function ImageNet. Exception is a deep convolutional neural network, which is used to find patterns in images. It uses a three-dimensional neural network to, to, to detect the colors of red, blue, and green, which frees up the memory of the network. Exception has 71 layers and can classify over 1000 images at a time. Uh, the model and weights are downloaded and then shaped into the required form as shown. Uh, then uh, it is pre-processing uh, or just converting the data into the correct format for training. Next, it's laying out the layers for the neural network that we plan to add on top of the 71. Um, the pre-processed data is stored in the value of X. And then the data is shaped into the input width, height, and input channels as shown, which is 150, 150, and, one, and, and 3 respectively. So here is an error we um, found in our code. Unfortunately, some files were corrupted, leading to some errors in the code. This may be due to the sizing error in the code or that the files weren't uploaded properly. 
Um, initially, the files were being run on the GPU, but then later we switched to CPU, which um, could lead to an error of some corrupted files. Um, but we plan on fixing that in the future. Um, the optimizer function we used was um, Atom, and it was uh, used with the binary cross entropy loss function. Uh, and the optimizer's basic purpose is to minimize the loss function. So currently, the accuracy was at about 63%, uh, but this value could be much higher once our code is improved and finished. Uh, in the future, again, we plan on writing a script to remove all the corrupted files. The fact that the model actually started to train but gave this error later on shows that the input is empty and that some files are missing from the data, which is a clear indication that our file is corrupted. So after we fix that, this model should be able to make really great predictions. Great, thank you to this group. Um, please wrap up in like the next five seconds. So yeah, in the future, we plan to refine our model and then submit to the papers below. Next slide. And these are our references for the data sets and the images we use. And we'd like to thank Mr. Subramanian for guiding us throughout this project and ASDRP for providing us a platform to conduct our research.